Well, good morning, everybody. Let's just briefly uh, come before our Lord. Blessed Father, we thank you that we can come before you and we can say, Our Father. And we do give thanks for this. And now as we come to your word, we just pray for your help, Lord, as we look at the the bread of life. Help as we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, our subject this morning is, of course, the Lord's Prayer. And the Lord's Prayer, it can be found in uh, both the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Luke. In Luke's account, we have, of course, the disciples, and they come to the Lord, and they say, uh, Lord, teach us how to pray, like John taught his disciples. And then the Lord says, after this manner, you should pray. And he goes into the Lord's Prayer, what we know as the Lord's Prayer. Matthew's account, which is part of what we call the Sermon on the Mount. And I'm sure you can recall last week how Martin talked to us concerning uh, be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before men and concerning giving. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it. So when you give, not if you give. And then he moves into prayer. Verse 5 of chapter 6. And when you pray, not if you pray, but when you pray, it's the norm for a Christian, for a believer to pray. And then he exhorts us, do not stand like the hypocrites do, for they love to pray, love to pray standing in the synagogues. For they have had their reward. And then he goes on to give instruction. And then in verse 9, we move into what we know as the Lord's Prayer. Do not be like them, for for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. This then is how you should pray. This then is how you should pray. And he begins, Our Father in heaven. Now, the Lord's Prayer can be divided into six petitions. The first three appertain to God and his glory. The second three appertain to our needs, our petitions before him, what we ask of him. It is a model prayer. It's a prayer that can be prayed privately. It can be prayed publicly. And it can be sung publicly. I love to hear it sung. I think it's majestic. But above all, it's a model. It's a template. It's a foundation prayer. A prayer for us to base our prayers on. Upon. And he begins, of course, by saying, Our Father. And what a wonderful blessing that is, isn't it? At times of extremity, at times when we may be at wit's end corner, at times of loneliness, times when we're hurting, we can approach our Heavenly Father. We can come before him. How on earth the world manages whilst trying to shut God out of their lives, I don't know. But the wonderful thing is that the believer can come before him. We can petition the God of grace, we can come before him. Notice we are exhorted to come directly to him when you pray, our Father in heaven. In other words, we do not come through Mary, 
We do not come through any of the saints, and we most certainly do not come through a priest. We come through a new and living way, and we come direct to our Father, who is in heaven. Now the question we have to ask is, is he the question of everyone? And the answer, I believe, is in the creative sense, yes, he is. God has created this world. And the human race bears his image. But the scriptures teach us that we, like sheep, have gone astray. But the good news is that God has laid upon him, Jesus Christ, the iniquity of his all. And so that when we come to him in repentance and faith, we are born again into his family. One of the readings that we had to start with this morning, and I didn't know it was going to be read, was to as many as believed, to them gave he the power to be called the sons of God. And so when a person, as it were, comes in repentance and faith to him, we are born into the family of God. And now, we are the children of God, as John puts it in, in, in his epistle. So by grace we are saved and we are brought into his family. And in his family, the Apostle Paul says in the book of Romans, we have received the Spirit, the Spirit whereby we can cry, Abba Father, our Father, who is in heaven. We move on then to hallowed be your name. Hallowed. Holy. Holy is his name. It's to be held in reverence. And so has the names of all the Trinity. The Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. But it's hallowed. It's a hallowed name. In the book of Isaiah, we have this wonderful, wonderful picture of the throne room of God. In Isaiah chapter 6, it tells us this. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet. And with two they were flying, and they were calling to one another, Holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. And this is the one we come to. And we are told to pray, Hallowed be your name. We are to remember that his name is holy. His name is hallowed. Thy kingdom come. What is the kingdom of God that we pray for here in verse 10? Your kingdom come. Well, one could answer that quite simply by saying the realm of God's domain. Luke chapter 17 verse 20 says that the, our Lord said to the Pharisees, the kingdom of God is within you. In the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 2, we read of Nebuchadnezzar who was a great king, the great autocrat, the greatest king in the world at that time. And he dreamed a dream. And it startled him, it frightened him, and no one could give the interpretation of this dream. And then we read that Daniel, he comes with the interpretation. Daniel, of course, was one of the captivity from Judah. And there he was in Babylon, and he interprets it. And he tells him the meaning of the dream. And the meaning was quite simply, it was 
to show Nebuchadnezzar what kingdoms would follow his kingdom. And we have kingdoms uh, there that would proceed his. But then in chapter 2, verse 44, we're told of another kingdom. And this is, I'll read it to you. It says this. In the time of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end. But it will itself endure forever. This, of course, is the kingdom of God. It will supersede all other earthly kingdoms. They will rise and fall. But his is an eternal kingdom. And this is the kingdom that we pray, your kingdom come. We pray that the light of the glorious gospel will shine in people's hearts. And that men and women and boys and girls will come to a saving knowledge of him and be born into his family. Thy kingdom come. We move on. Thy will be done. Well, in considering this one, I thought, I, I, read, I read something that I thought was good. And so I share it with you. I thought it was a far better explanation than what I could give. And the person who I've lent it from is John MacArthur. He's one of the great preachers in, in the States. And he's a tremendous... Uh, I believe a man of God and he puts this concerning thy will be done to pray thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven is to rebel against the worldly idea that sin is normal and inevitable it is to rebel against the world system of ungodliness, the dishonouring and rejection of Christ. To pray for God's will to be done means we must submit to God's perfect wisdom, even when going through trials. I thought that was a really good definition. And of course, the supreme example of someone submitting to the Father's will is our Lord Jesus, isn't it? In Matthew 26, verse 29, we read, Going a little further, he fell to the ground and prayed, Father, if it is possible, take this cup from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Your will be done. We then move into the next petition, and the next petition is one that is now concerning our earthly needs. Give us today our daily bread. And we do not pray here for the luxuries of life, but rather for our daily bread, for the essential, the essential things that we need in order to function safely and healthily as human beings. We pray for them, don't we? That God will, in his mercy, grant us the base things for, for life. And for those, we have to be, give thanks and be grateful in our hearts. Notice it says, give us not give me, but give us. In other words, we pray for the whole of humanity to have what is needed in order to survive through life. Give us this day our daily bread. But I believe it also includes what I would call our spiritual food, our spiritual bread. Our Lord said that man cannot live by bread 
alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. In other words, we can have everything, and yet we can never be fully satisfied. There will always be something missing within our life if we have not God, the bread of life. Without Jesus Christ, our life will always be meaningless and empty. I don't know about you, but one of the things that I find hard to recognise today is celebrities. Now, years ago, it didn't used to be like that at all. A celebrity was somebody who was talented and you, you, know, you had a special gift in and uh, as a result, you celebrated the talent, but it doesn't seem like that today at all. Um, sometimes when they're on quiz programmes, I have to ask Linda, is this a celebrity one or is it a, a normal one? Because I can't tell the difference. And sometimes the only way you can tell the difference is that the questions happen to be easier. <laughs> but it's true, isn't it? But it didn't used to be like that. And I once heard a story uh, that Scylla Black said. I thought it was, it was good. It was a long, long time ago, but it registered in the database. And she said this. Of course, she was a, a proper celebrity, an A-level, a, uh, a whatever you'd call it, celebrity. A-listed, thank you very much for that prompting. A-listed celebrity. And she said this. She once said that she was on a, sh a ship. It was a, one of these luxury, multi-millionaire sort of yachts. And they were off the coast of uh, the south of France. And she said everybody on that ship was a, what was it, A-listed celebrity. Everybody was either somebody in the public eye or a very, very wealthy. And she said... There we were on this ship. We had got everything. We'd got the best food. We'd got the best wines. You name it, we wanted for nothing. And she said, I was, it was a beautiful night. And I was leading, looking over the, you know, uh, in the distance. You could see the, uh, France and Monte Carlo in the distance or... And she said it was a beautiful night and I was standing next to Ringo Starr. He was, of course, the Beatle of the Drummers. And she said we were standing there looking out in the distance and then suddenly another boat appeared. And the other boat got... It was a similar sort of multimillionaire type yacht and it got nearer and nearer to theirs. And she said as it got nearer, you could hear the, the music and you could see the dancing and they were partying on this boat. And she said, you know what Ringo said to me? Wished I were on that ship. <laughs> you know, no matter what we've got, no matter where we are, it can never, ever fully satisfy. There will always be something missing in our lives if we have not got the bread of life. And the great question is, do you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your own personal Lord and Saviour? And if you are, are you neglecting the bread of life? What a wonderful thing it is to be able to feast upon him, the living bread. Something that this world cannot purchase, it cannot buy. It is God's gift to men and women who have become recipients of his grace. We move on. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we also have
forgiven our debtors. Debts, sins that we have committed, we must come before our Lord and confess them. And the scriptures tell us that if we confess our sins, he is just and able to forgive us our sins. But we read that we too have to forgive others. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And then in verse 14 he goes on to say, for if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. And we've got to confess as human beings that sometimes we can struggle with this. And it is for us to come before the throne of grace and for, to ask for help and his enabling so that we forgive others as he has forgiven us. Uh, a few weeks ago, well, in my, well, yeah, a few weeks ago in my quiet time, I came before a, a verse that stuck out to me. And it's con in Mark's Gospel, Mark chapter 6. It's concerning um, the beheading of John the Baptist that wicked, awful deed that was done. And what happened, Herod had a party. His wife was called Herodias. And her daughter danced at this feast. And it pleased Herod so much, he asked, he said, I'll give you whatever you want. And her mother told her to request the head of John the Baptist. What an awful, wicked thing. And sure enough, John was beheaded and his head brought in. But the verse that stuck out to me was this concerning Herodias. I'll just briefly turn to it. It says this. For John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And then verse 19, it says this. So Herodias nursed a grudge against John and wanted to kill him. And what stuck out to me was this, nursed a grudge. She nursed it. Now you think of this word to nurse. You get, you picture a woman, a lady, a mother, holding on to her precious baby and she cradling it. And it's so precious to her. And she's watching it. And she's not letting it go. She's keeping it. And she's holding it next to her heart. She's nursing it. And that is the same terminology that's used here, isn't it? For a grudge. And how careful we've got to be when we are offended, when we are hurt. That we don't fall into that trap. How careful careful we've got to be haven't we that we don't nurse it that it doesn't become as it were an obsession and precious to us and something that we're constantly recalling but rather we've got to see it to, as it were responding grace forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors And of course we've got the supreme 
example of forgiveness with our Lord on Calvary's cross when he cries, Forgive, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. We move on. Lead us not into temptation. Lead us not into temptation. Now it's not a sin to be tempted. Our Lord was tempted. But it is a sin to yield to it. And of course this verse reminds us that we are in a battle. And that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood but spiritual principalities and powers. Now, I don't know if you've ever heard of the name Billy Sunday. But he was an American evangelist. He preceded, he was in the generation before Billy Graham. But he was, in his day, was a great evangelist. And he's, he's actually named in a, a song that Frank Sinatra sings. And it's called Chicago. If you look through the lyrics, you'll find his name, Billy Sunday. And Billy Sunday apparently, excuse me, used to say that Christians very often fall into sin because they treat they fall into sin because they treat sin like cheesecake rather than a rattlesnake. It's true, isn't it? How careful we have to be and seek to be in our walk before the Lord. Deliver us from the evil one. It reminds us we're in a battle and we've got to, as it were, be on our guard constantly and looking to him to deliver us and lead us not into temptation. Then the final part of the verse, deliver us from the evil one. Deliver us from the evil one. We are reminded that there is an enemy, an enemy of the soul, the devil. And although pitfalls are inevitable, we do not go looking for them, but rather we pray to be delivered from them. In the book of Judges, there's a story of, of course, I'm sure you're all familiar with it, of Samson. Samson was a man of God. He was a judge in Israel. He was a Nazarite. And yet he fell in such a tragic way. And there he was, this judge of Israel this man who was a man of faith and he became so ensnared with his girlfriend Delilah that even when she's asking him where his strength lay and he knew she would betray him you can soon deduct that from the context of the verses in the story he totally yields to her how utterly tragic that this man is so encaptured in such a way. And can I say that as Christians, should we too be ever ensnared? There is one that can free us. There is one that can set us free. And that we pray but deliver us from the evil one. And there is one who can set the prisoner free. As the hymn writer says, his blood avails for me. The scriptures say that the blood of Jesus Christ, God's son, it cleanseth us from all sin. 
and the prisoner can be set free. I think when you look at the story of Samson, do you know one of the great things I think concerning showing the grace of God in that story is, if you read chapter 11 of the book of Hebrews, you get a list of people that's done great things by faith. Do you know whose name's there? Samson. Even though he'd strayed so widely, I became so enslaved to sin. His name is still there. Doesn't it show the grace of God? Uh, there's, one, there's one that can free from sin. Samson paid a great price. His eyes were put out. He became a prisoner and, and, and sport for the Philistines. But yet... In his death, he slew more than in his life. And God answered his prayer when he came and said, Remember me.